This is the lecture for European history for Thursday, the 10th of February, 2022. Uh, today, I'm allowing my lesson plan to be hijacked a little bit because I received a treasure trove of additional romantic stuff yesterday from a person in this class who shall remain nameless, but whose initials are S.N. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know how long this will take, but yesterday we studied Caspar David Friedrichs' Wander, uh, Wanderer in a Sea of Fog, Taylor Gary Coe's Raft of the Medusa, John Const Constable's Hay Wayne, Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare, Eugene De La Croix's Death of Sardanapalus, does end quotes at some point. Uh, for music, we did Berlioz from Symphony Fantastique, Dream of Witches, Sabbath, uh, Wagner's Die Curie, The Storm, and Goethe Dameron, uh, Secret Funeral March of Mahler Symphony No. 5 as well as looking at Percy B. Shelley's Ozymandias and some quotes from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and there was even a little Tennyson thrown in Ulysses. Now, what I'm going to do is just see and play some of the things that my students sent, and if I have trouble calling things up, I may call her up to help with this. But, turn the right light switch off, please. We'll start with paintings. Thank you. Okay, so, we've got, actually we could probably start with poetry. A Poison Tree by William Blake. So, let the Poetry Foundation find that one. Okay, Let's see how long this is. Not that long. Okay. You know what would be nice? Projecting. Yeah, that'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? Okay. While the uh, projector is spooling up, let's find some other things. So. Uh, the Phantom Wooer by Thomas Lower Bedos. Phantom Wooer. I'm probably spelling uh, pronouncing that wrong. Phantom Wooer. Okay. Yeah. Home Hunter. Looks like it. Yes. I don't want somebody reading it. I'm going to read it. My job. Okay, so we got the Phantom Wooer up. That's good. Uh, pause. Phantom Wooer. Uh, let's see. And I guess we'll just go from there. Actually, I'm going to start with some quotes. This is from Camille Paglia. Camille Paglia is... Uh, one of the only feminists that I respect. That's actually a lot for me to admit, because I think feminism in general has become an odious idea that once had a purpose, but that today does nothing but perpetuate itself by endless division and by railing against the natural order of society as if it's an artificial patriarchy. Um, I, I like individualism, and I liked it when feminists were arguing that women who chose to choose untraditional paths should not have any barriers in their way. I'm for that. To me, that's what feminism and, in fact, all civil rights movements should be about. Fairness under the law and under the customs, equal opportunity. Make sure you have your notes set. But... Uh, Feminism has gone in a different path in my lifetime. But Camille Paglia is an independent thinker. She questions the orthodoxy. She uh, actually seems to have genuine intellectual curiosity and honesty. And whether I agree with someone or not, if they have intellectual curiosity, 
And if they're honest about some of the implications of their ideas, if they're not just my team, right, all time, my team, and she's not, she really isn't. So she, along with Doris Lessing, along with George Orwell, are people who are very much on the left, who I deeply respect, because they themselves behave in a manner that shows great integrity. So she writes, High romanticism shows you nature in all its harsh and lovely metamorphoses. Flood, fire, and quake fling us back to the primal struggle for survival and reveal our gross dependency on mammoth, still mysterious forces. She's right. We humans like to play movies while we're flying. Think about that. You're flying five miles above the surface of the earth, close to the speed of sound, without a pressure suit, without uh, uh, an oxygen mask, in relative comfort. You can look down upon the clouds. You can see the Mississippi River like a little oil streak across the Great Plains. And we watch a movie and we eat our nuts or our cookies, and we deny the, response, the, the experience. Why? Because we're five miles in the air! Which is scary. <laughs> to me, we have better tools. We are cleaner. We have longer lives. We have more medication. We got better weapons. But fundamentally, we're mortal. We're fallible. We're not inherently different from those savages that first behold, beheld the thunderstorm and quaked in terror. We're really not. And the more we try to hide this from ourselves, the more on some basic level we need to reconnect with reality. And sometimes that involves taking a camping trip or going back to nature or watching a beautiful looking at a beautiful romantic painting or listening to something that stirs the soul, something that reminds us that life isn't so packed safe, that there are still mysteries in the world. Oh God, I love this quote. All the inventions, all the good inventions have already been discovered. What, what kind of mindset is that? All the good inventions, really a hundred years from now, they'll laugh. Uh, all the good inventions were discovered by 2022, really? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. There's still mystery and wonder in the world. And it's, it's, worth, it's worth cultivating that desire to encounter it. It's good for you. Edgar Allan Poe. You've got good English teachers. I presume you know that Edgar Allan Poe is really the father of American horror literature. Uh, and he's the inspiration of later writers like H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King. Um, Cask of Amontillado, The Raven, others. I actually like Poe, uh, to an extent. And Poe, who wrote at the time of the Romantics, and whose poetry and story, short stories are redolent of the Romantic era, says, Men have called me mad, but the question is not settled whether madness is or is not the loftiest of intelligence. I may have told you that the American Psychology Association about a decade ago publicly wrestled with the question, do we remove narcissist personality disorder from our list of mental illnesses? Narcissist personality disorder is the loss of empathy for others, the loss of an objective understanding that you are not the only person in the world. A narcissist is like the ultimate selfie person. They go around the world and they don't take pictures of the Taj Mahal or of the statue of Queen Victoria in Victoria, Canada, or the, the, the Eiffel Tower or the Statue of Liberty. No, they take pictures of themselves in front of the Eiffel Tower or in front of the Taj Mahal. Like their ugly mug is the most important thing in the world. A narcissist. Well, you know the Greek legend, I hope. Narcissist. Yeah. Somebody want to tell me? Yeah. So, um, he, he basically, okay, so there's this girl named Echo, right? And she came up to him and was like, hey, 
but she doesn't speak. She only can speak the last word of what the other person is saying to her. And so he was like, you know what? Here, come out. I want to like make love to you. And then she did. And then she's and then he was like, oh, actually, no, I don't like you. And so then there was this other goddess who was, and she, Echo was heartbroken. So she went back into her cave. And she eventually starved to death because she was just so sad. And so then this other goddess was like, you know what? I'm going to get revenge on this guy. And so he was looking at this puddle, and all of a sudden, he's just so infatuated with his own reflection that he couldn't leave it. And so then he just eventually ended up dying. Yeah. Self absorption is not a good thing. And our society is steeped in it. There are whole political groups of people out there that want to trap you into their lie by convincing you that they're the ones that will allow you to be your true inner selfness in public and the world will bend to it. <clears throat> we're part of the world. We matter. But we're not the most important thing. Um, in any case, why were they debating whether or not to get rid of this as a diagnosable mental illness? because it was becoming so common that it was the norm. And scientifically, logically, but because of their nomenclature, they could not keep a, dis, a, 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 a dysfunction that was normal. That was just society now. Now, ultimately, I think they kept it on the list of their diagnosable conditions. But the fact that they had to ask this question, and they really wrestled with it, indicates how common narcissism is today. Uh, Self-absorption. What does this have to do with Poe and Romanticism? God touches people. That's what ancients used to believe. Madmen were touched by God. An infinite touches a finite and zaps them out like a lightning bolt. Is madness dysfunction? Or is madness a supreme individual insight and intuition about life that other people simply don't share? Is every creative individual a madman? Is every entrepreneur a madman? Is every artist mad? Well, by certain definitions, because they think unconventionally, yeah. So madness, while horrifying, can also be divine. And one of the horrors I have of our medicated society is that we're taking the next Van Gogh and we're making them into Joe Normal. In any case, let's look at the poetry. If you have comments, questions, or thoughts, I presume you'll raise your hands. So let's start with the poison tree. Do you have anything to say about this beforehand? Uh, no, this is, I did a lot of research um, yesterday and I, this one among the other one just really popped out to me. I thought it was very real. Okay. I've never read it before, so this is good. So this is by William Blake, The Poison Tree. I was angry with my friend. I told my... I, to, I told... I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not. My wrath did grow. And I wanted it in fears. Watered it in fears. Pre-reading helps. And I watered it in fears, night and morning, with my tears, and I sunned it with smiles and with soft, deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright. And my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole. The morning glad I see, my foe outstretched beneath the tree. Cold. Any thoughts? Vengeance. <laughs> That's what I get from. I get sa satiated vengeance. Am I missing something? Is there something else there that other people say? Vengeance is scary. A phantom wooer. Now, a wooer. Continuing to use things. Um, if I fall in love with someone and I want them to marry me, and this has happened, I wooed my girlfriend to become my girlfriend, to become my fiance, and then to become my wife. 
There was wooage going on. Woo. So, uh, with that in mind, let's see where he goes with this. The Phantom Wooer. A ghost that loved a lady fair ever in the starry air of midnight at her pillow stood, and with sweetness skies above, the luring words of human love, her soul the phantom wooed. Sweet and sweet is their poison's note, the little snakes of silver throat in mossy skulls that nest and lie, ever singing die, oh die. Young soul, put off your flesh and come with me into the quiet tomb. Our bed is lovely, dark, and sweet. The earth will swing us as she goes beneath our covered coverlid of snows. And the warm leaden sheet, dear and dear is their poisoned note. The little snakes of silver throat in mossy skulls that nest and lie, ever singing, die, oh, die. That's Thomas Lovell Bedoes. Okay. I was too busy reading to really grasp a lot of that. So would somebody like to reflect it, explain it, react to it? Did you get it? Did you hear it? Did you read it? Yes. Um, I think that basically um, the, the person that's alive ended up falling in love with the ghost, and then they killed themselves. Do you think it was somebody who was grieving for their love and couldn't let go, or do you think it was something else? That sounds right. I'll just speculate. Sir. It seemed a lot like the manifestation of death was the ghost and it wooed and she was like on her deathbed and the, the ghost was kind of wooing her to death so in effect a bit like the blue oyster cult song don't fear the reaper yes exactly like that. which uh, is an interesting take on death and no i don't believe it's a song that advocates suicide although there are those who believe it does i do not um since you picked it shauna see what stood out for you uh, the reason I chose that is I thought it was really pretty how in romanticism, oftentimes in poetry, they kind of, they romanticize death and they found it as something beautiful and full of romantic. And they always, um, not always, but the way that they thought death was not something to fear and more beautiful, and it can be rather enticing, I found that just very interesting. I thought that that was really pretty. That's why I chose that. Okay. No, and, and there is something to be said for that. I once read an essay by somebody who was wrestling with grief. And they speculated that the last thing a person should say before they leave should... The last thing you should say to somebody who is dying is, please don't die, I need you, I can't live without you. Because the person who's dying is going to feel like a failure. The person who's dying is going to feel like they're letting you down because their body is no longer working and they're soul is going to have to leave it soon. The desperation that's connected with death is real. I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose any of my, either of my cats. I don't want to lose anyone that I care about. I certainly don't want to lose any of you. The, the desperation about death, though, is only a part of what death should be. Death is normal. Whether, I mean, it's hard to accept in somebody young. It's hard to accept as the result of war or an accident, but sooner or later, that's what our fate is. And to view it only with fear and with a loathing and with, a, with aversion is to steal something from life. We feed off of death. Our food is dead, unless you eat some very unusual things. And trust me, if you eat something that's alive, it's going to die inside of you. Hopefully. <laughs> um... Life and death, it, it's, it, 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 it's, you know, blood makes the grass grow. Um, anyway, thank you. So, now let's look at some art. Uh, oh, here's one. A Beautiful Death by uh, De La Roche. Oh, okay, so let's see. De La Roche. Okay. 
Okay, image. Yep. Okay, so now we need a whole painting. Oh, that's Lady Jane. This doesn't look like the whole thing. Let's see if there's a better version. Alright, I'll just do So, let's see if I can get it this way. Now that is Stark. Um. A Beautiful Death by Paul Hippolyte uh, de la Roche. This is the wife of the artist Louis Vermont Verme on her deathbed, 1845-46. That's disturbing to me. My initial reaction to it is not, uh, wow, that's beautiful. Because... First of all, this is remarkably realistic. Uh, romantic era paintings are usually melodramatic. Uh, there, there are melodramatic things about this: the pose, the the semi-open eyes, the the expression on her face. But the depiction of the body itself, of the hair, is very realistic. It's almost photorealistic, which is something the painters began to abandon once daguerreotypes and, photog and photographs came along. So. Um, are there reactions that people have to this before I ask Ms. Narex why she chose it? Yes. I noticed the halo around her head. Yeah. I think that's the first thing I saw. I wonder if that's real or if that's part of her bedding. Either way, the artist obviously intended it to be a halo. Yeah. Uh, but Victorian beds and couches sometimes have these weird little accoutrements. <laughs> yes. So the black shadow or... Not the shadow, but just the blackness near her head. It looks like just death pulling her away slowly. Yeah. It also really starkly illuminates the face. Um, no, she looks dead. And that is just to see such a beautiful recreation of the woman after life has left her. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she's still alive, but she looks dead to me. Why'd you choose? Um, well, because someone had to see her uh, laying there, just lifeless, and found it tragic, of course, but also they were like, I want to encapsulate how beautiful she is in this moment, even though she's no longer with us. And so they had that image either like burned in their brain, or they actually sat there with her there and painted it. Um, just, I found that very sad, but the fact that they could take something so tragic and perfectly just make it really beautiful, but also have just hints of like darkness in it. It's a, no, it's a real dedication. It's a gift to the dead and to the grief. Definitely. Now we've got La Casa de Locos by Francisco Goya. The House of the Crazies is how I would translate that. But some of you who have a better Espagnol than I uh, may uh, have a different. Casa de Locos. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, by Goya. Okay, I'm gonna. I don't even want to know. There we go. There we go. Okay. So let's. Yes. House of Madness, uh, the House of the Crazies. Does anyone have a better definition of locos than that? Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. Uh, but well, let's let's see what we have here. Um, okay, this looks like Bedlam. Bedlam, by the way, was a madhouse in London. So you have. Oh. This actually reminds me of a place that I once saw when I was working with the mentally retarded. It was called Pineland Center. It was a, a mental retardation asylum and, and mental illness facility. 
in Maine. One of the things that people who are touched and troubled often do is they often make themselves naked. They're not always comfortable in clothing. And many of them are in their own little worlds, but they're together. And in asylums of that era, they were basically kept alive, they were fed, they were cleansed, but under conditions that today we wouldn't really consider to be humane. So what I get from this is actually the reality of a, a group facility of the old school um, that basically warehouses the mat. Um, so what do you see that I am not? What do you get that I'm not getting? What additional insights do you have that you're laughing at, Daigle? What? What? Yeah, no, there is not there is not naughty stuff going on off to the right. Okay? Just I'm not saying that that's what you're thinking. I I cannot imagine Boy yeah, you for bringing attention to that. I didn't even well, notice. No, it's it's obviously there. Uh, um, no, I, I I don't believe that that's that's what's going on, and we're no, we're not going to look too much closer. I don't know. There's somebody who happens to be sitting there, and somebody who happens to be behind them, and it looks suggestive. I don't know. Maybe it is. I, I Goya's great really, thing. The guy right there who's just kind of like has the crown on. He's yeah. Like, yeah. No, on the bottom right. <laughs> bottom right. Ah, yeah. Uh, no. and, the, and the one right now. Oh, yeah. Guy. He's like, hey. <laughs> Happy guy. There's something going on behind me that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're all... What about it? Okay, well, go ahead and Oh, no, I was, I was asking oh, Jackson okay, first. Sorry, I got excited. It's insane. Yeah. Like, I don't know what's happening in this picture. The well, bodies are melding together in the background. It's madness. Yeah, it's And really... madness is a terrifying thing because it can happen to anyone. True story. My favorite TV show of all time was a 1990 science fiction uh, epic called Babylon 5. Babylon 5's pilot and first season had a star named Michael O'Hare. He played a character, Jeffrey Sinclair. And he mysteriously left the show at the end of the first season, and they got a new lead actor. That's very unusual in those days. You get a new lead for a TV show. And his departure was never properly explained until his death uh, about 10 years ago. The plot lines involved him having, quote, a hole in his mind. In other words, he had been captured by aliens and things were done to him, and those memories were then lifted from him. So there was a weakness in his mental faculties that led him to paranoia and that others could exploit because there's a hole in his mind. Unfortunately, this just happened to be the kryptonite of that actor. Nobody had diagnosed any problems with him before. He was a functioning actor. He'd played in a number of Broadway roles and, and roles on TV. But this got to him, and he began to react on during rehearsals in a very unusual way. And at the end of the first season, it became clear this wasn't working, so he left. And it was a choice on his part and the producer. He ended up being treated for mental illness for the rest of his life. That plot line in a fictional show caused a weakness in his mentality to unravel, and his sanity never recovered. That's scary to me. I've been in moments of depression and despair in my life, that have overwhelmed me at times, and I know how horrible and out of control that feels. That's part of life. But madness, real madness can come to anyone. It's not just something that people with, that are, they're born with it. There, there just could be something that happens. Weird. Anyway, thank you for choosing this. Very about it. Do you have anything more to say before I go to Sam? Um, I just picked this one because the artist, uh, Goya, was famous for liking to draw um, madhouses, and people who were um, less fortunate and had, there was just, it was just very real. It wasn't 
like oh yeah he, he no drew there's what no was romantic there, like most people don't really want to talk about and things that were ugly he would draw and just like paint that mm -hmm. and people thought that it was um just it it wasn't quite already happened it was just very new that people would see things yeah. that they didn't want to well uh, other uh, you know northern renaissance rembrandt painted everyday scenes van gogh later during the impressionists was famous for painting everyday life for, at, at times and that was something that people hadn't seen but your statement yesterday, Roberta, that uh, the, the painting that they were showing at the beginning of Dreams of a Witch's Sabbath was Goya. Um, it's been a while since I've looked closely at Goya, but I think you're absolutely right. It certainly fits. Thank you. Sam? Uh, I was just thinking about the actor thing. And I think like something that makes a really good actor is that they're able to put themselves in the situation. Like, yeah. And so I think, like, I'm guessing what happened there is like himself in It's like... Wait a second. Yeah. Like, this is not. Having a boundary between reality and fantasy is very important. Um, and this is somebody who has played Dungeons and Dragons since the 70s. I love imaginative things. Consequently, I tend to have friends who are very out there and imaginative. But some of them have, have had problems because they lose that ability to distinguish fantasy from reality. And it's a problem. And I think, yeah, I think that's what happened. It's just, it's a sad story. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, who else did you have as, you had Gothic architecture. Um, Shaughnessy, I'm going to let you come up and uh, actually find some of the things that you oh. found. Do you mind? Uh, sure. I don't know if we can find them again. I can try. Okay. Uh, should you be photographed or not? No, I don't care. Okay. Um, I think what I'll do is I will uh, actually, we'll continue this on, in verbal, but rather than have you stared at by the camera for a while, I'm just going to put it up there so if people want to listen, they can listen. Okay. So you bring up the architecture and you can also bring up some of the music too. Okay? Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... Cool. The reason I'm doing this is she brought up some interesting things. I had a little extra time, and uh, it's broadening my understanding. So I, I just think they're interesting uh, exhibits that she brought up. Okay, so um, I chose Gothic gargoyles, of course, as a big part of romanticism, because they would, they're, they're monsters. They really didn't bring um, just fear much into just daily life. And then they chose like sculptures of these monsters and it just became normal. And I thought that was just really cool of the Romantic era. Um, Gothic cathedrals from the Middle Ages did this too. Yeah. And the Romantics both fixated on them. Yeah, they, they found it rather beautiful and not necessarily, um, part of it was of course religious, but another part was just the, the beauty of it and just the absolute like perfection in the details of every bit of it. Any comments? Um, well, I'm kind of confused. Why would gargoyles be present um, in like religious settings? It's supposed to be like, so you can like purge yourself of like your own kind of metaphorical gargoyles.